Well, good morning. We're going to be uh, working this morning from the book of 1 Samuel and chapter 15. 1 Samuel chapter 15. Thank you for joining us this morning at Forge Road Bible Chapel. I trust that you're going to find our discussion to be profitable both intellectually and spiritually. This morning we're continuing our series in the life of Samuel and we are rounding towards the finish. We have just two weeks left after today. And I trust that you remember that it, from 1 Samuel chapters 9 and 10 that Samuel had anointed Saul as king over Israel. And then in chapter 12, he gave what Jeff Wolgamoth called Samuel's farewell address. It's now some years later, and the lives of these two men, Samuel and Saul, have intersected several times. This morning we're going to focus on the last time that they were ever together and the sad end of a story that began with great promise. This is an account from which we can draw important and indeed essential spiritual lessons by which we can be warned and strengthened and renewed on our pilgrimage together. So 1 Samuel chapter 15 and starting at verse 1. Samuel also said to Saul, the Lord sent me to anoint you king over his people, over Israel. Now therefore heed the voice of the words of the Lord. Thus says the Lord of hosts, I will punish Amalek for what he did to Israel, how he ambushed him on the way when he came up from Egypt. Now go and attack Amalek and utterly destroy all that they have. And do not spare them, but kill both man and woman, infant and nursing, child, ox and sheep, camel and donkey. So Saul gathered the people together and numbered them at Telaim, 200,000 foot soldiers and 10,000 men of Judah. Verse 7, and Saul attacked the, Am the, Sa Saul attacked the Amalekites from Havla all the way to Shur, which is east of Egypt. He also took Agai, king of the Amalekites, alive and utterly destroyed all the people with the edge of the sword. But Saul and the people spared Agak, and the best of the sheep, the oxen, the fatlings, the lambs, and all that was good, and were unwilling to utterly destroy them, but everything despised and worthless, that they utterly destroyed. Now the word of the Lord came to Samuel, saying, I greatly regret that I have set up Saul as king, for he has turned back from following me and has not performed my commandments. And it grieved Samuel. He cried out to the Lord all night. So when Samuel rose early in the morning to meet Saul, it was told Samuel, saying, Saul went to Carmel, and indeed he set up a monument for himself. And he's gone on around, passed by, and gone down to Gilgal. And Samuel went to Saul, and Saul said to him, Blessed are you of the Lord, I have performed the commandment of the Lord. But Samuel said, What then is this bleeding of the sheep in my ears, and the lowing of the oxen which I hear? And Saul said, They have brought them from the Amalekites, for the people spared the best of the sheep and the oxen to sacrifice to the Lord your God, and the rest we have utterly destroyed. Then Sam Samuel said to Saul, Be quiet. And I will tell you what the Lord said to me last night. And he said, speak on. So Samuel said, when you were little in your own eyes, were you not head of the tribes of Israel? And did not the Lord anoint you king over Israel? Now the Lord sent you on a mission and said, go and utterly destroy the sinners, the Amalekites, and fight against them until they are consumed. Why then did you not obey the voice of the Lord? Why did you swoop down on the spoil and do evil in the sight of the Lord? And Saul said to Samuel, but, but I have obeyed the voice of the Lord, and gone on the mission which the Lord sent me, and, and brought back Agai, king of Amalek. I, I have utterly destroyed the Amalekites, but took the plunder, the Sheep and the oxen, the, the best of the things which should have been utterly destroyed, to sacrifice to the Lord your God in Gilgal. So Samuel said, has the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, 
and to heed than the fat of rams. For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft, and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he also has rejected you from being king. Then Saul said to Samuel, I have sinned, for I have transgressed the commandment of the Lord and your words, because I feared the people and obeyed their voice Now, therefore, please pardon my sin and return with me that I may worship the Lord. But Samuel said to Saul, I will not return with you. For you have rejected the word of the Lord, and the Lord has rejected you from being king over Israel. And as Samuel turned around to go, Saul seized the edge of his robe and it tore. So Samuel said to him, the Lord has torn the kingdom of Israel from you today and has given it to a neighbor of yours who is better than you. And also the strength of Israel will not lie or relent, for he is not a man that he should relent. Verse 35. And Samuel went no more to see Saul until the day of his death. Nevertheless, Samuel mourned for Saul, and the Lord regretted that he had made Saul king over Israel. Now the Lord said to Samuel, How long will you mourn for Saul, seeing I have rejected him from reigning over Israel? Fill your horn with oil and go. I am sending you to Jesse, the Bethlehemite, for I prepared myself, for I provided myself a king among his sons. May the Lord bless, giving us a good understanding of his word this morning. The life of Samuel has two separate and great themes as a series. And we've seen both of them as we've moved through these meetings. First, the story is filled with rich character studies, men and women who would be a casting director's dream with personalities so big that they fill up the stage. They move all around with Samuel in the center and they exemplify spiritual principles spiritual principles, almost like they were characters in Pilgrim's Progress. And what we can learn by doctrine in the New Testament, we can watch in the history that seems like a morality play. We've seen Hannah, Samuel's mother, the personification of faithfulness, pleading with the Lord for a child and receiving Samuel and then giving him back. We've seen Eli, the old priest, who seemed to embody in himself the old, worn-out, corrupt generation that was just going through the motions when suddenly the Spirit of the Lord began to speak anew. Saul, who we're going to talk about today, a man of every physical virtue but a hollow core who Israel would make king because he was tall and handsome and looked the part. Next week, we're going to meet Eliab, Jesse's uh, oldest son who was essentially the same man who was up for the same job, and for Samuel it must have seemed like deja vu all over again, to quote the great American philosopher Yogi Berra. And then David, a man after God's own heart. Each of them was a real person with real experiences and real emotions, yet are crafted in the account as the incarnation of a greater spiritual principle. And that's the lesson we want to take this morning as we consider Saul and the Lord's rejection of him as king. Now, just as the historical account has the setting, as Saul takes his army against Amalek, assembling and numbering his men at Telaim, fighting down to Shur, and then returning with the spoil through Carmel and then to Gilgal, and that's where he meets Samuel. So the spiritual story also has a setting that it emerges from. It emerges from a phenomenon that flows so strongly through biblical history that it cannot be coincidental. The Apostle Paul expresses it directly in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, where he writes, For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ all shall be made alive. And so it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living being. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. However, the spiritual is not first, but the natural, and afterwards the spiritual. The first man was of the earth, made of dust. The second man is the Lord from heaven. 
As was the man of dust, so also are all those who are made of dust. And as is the heavenly man, so also are all those who are heavenly. And as we have borne the image of the man of dust, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly man. Paul is here contrasting Adam, the man of the earth, and Jesus Christ, the Lord of heaven. He is explaining that we are all born in Adam. And when saved by faith, we become in Christ and look to the day when our very bodies are made into his likeness. All who are in Adam will die. All who are in Christ will be made alive. Key verse for our discussion today is verse 46 of 1 Corinthians 15. The spiritual is not first, but the natural, and after that, the spiritual. This is a very important principle. It's first the natural and then the spiritual. It's first the man of dirt and second the Lord from heaven. It is first the flesh and then the spirit. It is first the old man and then the new. It is first the covenant of the law and then the new covenant in Jesus Christ. We were actually talking about that this morning at the Lord's table. Death and condemnation are in the first. Life and salvation are in the second. We are born first in Adam, and in Adam all die. All those who are born again by faith in Jesus Christ are a new creation. Talking about that also this morning, and passed from death unto life. Saul was first. He was the first king. He was rejected by God, and by the end of 1 Samuel 15, God is ready to anoint a new, a second, a new king in Bethlehem. This is so important that it is played out for us, not just in Saul and David, but in Old Testament character studies over and over and over again. Consider right from the beginning, Adam had two sons. First was Cain, a farmer, A man of the earth who tilled the ground and offered to God the fruit of his labors and was rejected. His second son was Abel, who who by faith brought a lamb. Abraham's first son was Ishmael, born naturally and was cast out. His second was Isaac, a son of promise who was born, as it were, from out of the dead. Isaac's firstborn was Esau, a mighty hunter who sold his birthright. And his second was Jacob, who valued God's blessing. Jacob's first son was Reuben. And the son of his second wife was Joseph. In each case, the blessings of God passed away from the first and vested in the second. In each case, the first is the embodiment of the old, the natural, the flesh. And the second is demonstrative of the new and the spiritual just like Saul and David. This is something that is so important that God plays it for us in surround sound. And from every one of the speakers comes the same message. The spiritual is not first, but the natural, and and afterwards, the spiritual. Now, in his writings, the Apostle Paul talks a lot about the flesh, that the flesh lusts against the spirit, that the flesh cannot please God, that that in the flesh sinful passions are at work. Each of these firstborns is demonstrative of the flesh and demonstrative of the old nature, although each in a different way. Cain works hard. He doesn't understand why hard work is not enough to satisfy God. He thinks life is unfair. And so he's angry at God and he's angry at life. And you might know some people who are angry at life. Ishmael, in the words of scripture, was a wild ass of a man. His life was out of control. No boundaries. Always in trouble. His hand against everyone. Everyone's hand against him. He's always making bad decisions. You might know some people like that, too. Esau was a mighty hunter. He rides at the head of 400 men. Esau is Mr. Success or Ms. Businesswoman, vice president of sales, climbing the corporate ladder. Reuben is as unstable as water. 
He's not sure about anything in life or her life, and he doesn't seem to have any direction. Lots of good intentions, but can never really get anywhere. You might know all of these people, but of all these firsts, Saul gets the most pages in Scripture. And so if you want to understand what the Scripture calls the flesh, I suggest that the best character in the Bible to study is King Saul. Saul is the fullest, the most complete picture of someone who lives in the flesh. Just as David is a great picture of Christ and the shepherd king, so Saul is the living, breathing, walking around embodiment of the old man. And if you want to understand how and why the flesh cannot please God, Look at the relationship and listen to the conversations between Saul and Samuel. Now, Saul looks great. He comes from a rich family. He's handsome, as handsome a man as there was in all of Israel, and a full head taller. He really looked the part. He's the king that the people want, in the words of Samuel. By the standards of the world, he checks every box. But have you ever heard the phrase, he's a weak man's idea of what a strong man should look like? That's King Saul, a weak man's idea of what a strong man should look like. For when it comes to spiritual things, Saul is clueless. He cannot understand the will of God. He cannot trust the word of God, not even when it's laid out before him in black and white. You might remember from chapters 9 and 10, Norris Gorman's message where Samuel was first meeting Saul, and he met with him on the top of a house. He talked with him in detail about God's purposes to establish a kingdom, and his role was a king, and then he anointed him as king, and the commander over the Lord's inheritance. And when Saul gets home, his family asked him, what would you talk to Samuel about? And Saul replied that they talked about some donkeys that had gotten lost. Samuel's talking about God's kingdom, and Saul hears about lost donkeys. Same thing in chapter 15. Samuel says, attack attack Amalek, destroy ox and sheep, camel and donkey. Saul hears, keep the sheep, keep the ox, and keep everything that is valued to you, and destroy the rest. See, Saul is happy to do what the Lord says, so long as it conforms with his economic interest. And when the choice comes between the two, he always picks what he thinks is in his best interest in the short term. And maybe you know some people like that, too. The natural man does not receive the things of God, for they are foolishness to him. The commands from Samuel don't make any sense to Saul. In the book of Galatians, we read, the works of the flesh are evident, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanliness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envies, envies, murders, drunkenness, revelry, and the like. And I suppose... Every one of us maybe struggles with something on that list. Remember those men I mentioned earlier? Those firstborns? Cain, Ishmael, Esau, Reuben? Those were the things that defined their lives. From Cain's murder to Abel, to Ishmael's contentions against Isaac, to Esau's ambition, to Reuben's fornication and adultery. And you can find most of that list In King Saul, you can find murder, you can find contentions, you can find ambition, you can find selfishness, you can find hatred, you can find his lewdness, you can find cursing, you can find outbursts of wrath, you can find envy, you can even find sorcery, as we're going to talk about in two weeks. 
So here in Gilgal, we have a confrontation. We have Samuel speaking the word of God. And we have Saul trying to explain why he didn't do it. Samuel talks to him like he was a child. Be quiet, he says. Didn't I tell you, he says. On one side is Samuel speaking the truth. As scripture speaks the truth. As the spirit of God speaks the truth. As Jesus Christ spoke the truth. And on the other side is King Saul who can't handle the truth. We read this exchange in chapter 15, and honestly, listening to Saul talk to Samuel at Gilgal sounds something like me talking with my scale in the bathroom in the morning. Now, I don't know about you, but I have discussions with my scale in the bathroom in the morning. I do most of the talking, the scale wins most of the arguments. Saul is confronted with the truth, and Saul tries two different methods to avoid the truth. The first response of Saul to Samuel sounds like this. Ah, no. Oh, no, don't you tell me that. No, 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 no. Look, I'm doing what I'm supposed to do. I'm doing what I'm supposed to do most of the time anyway, except the weekends. Weekends don't count. And I don't understand why you can't be giving me some credit for the things that I'm doing that I'm doing right, right? If you can't do a better job, there are other scales, you know. I can get other scales at the store. That's what Saul says. But I have obeyed the voice of the Lord. I did what I was supposed to do. Maybe not exactly what I was supposed to do, but pretty good. I should be getting some credit for being pretty good. That's the flesh talking. And when that doesn't work, the second response by Saul to Samuel sounds like this. Man, I'm really sorry. (laughs) I'm really, 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 really sorry. I didn't really mean to do that, but you know, I mean, there was the food there. It was the day that it was the chapel picnic. I mean, we were all there and we're having, I went home and there was a ball game. We had some pizza and I mean, you know, I just, I'm really sorry. Can't you give me a break here? It's very interesting that I can count four times in 1 Samuel when Saul admits that he's wrong in chapter 15, in chapter 19, in chapter 24, in chapter 26, he swears to change, even with tears. And each time, he goes back to his old ways. Have you ever noticed that about your life? The repeated, professed repentance of the flesh? Have you ever struggled with something that you know is wrong? Maybe it's anger or profanity or alcoholism or pornography or pride or gossip. You know that it's wrong. You know that it's bad. You swear to yourself you're not going to do that anymore. And this time you're really going to put it behind you. And what happens? You find yourself doing the same things that you promised you would never do again. Saul is not really sorry for his sin. He's sorry for the consequences of his sin. He's not really concerned about repentance. He's concerned about results, and he's concerned about his image. There is an immediate giveaway in Saul's insincerity. It is the word because. Yes, Samuel, I sinned because I feared the people. Samuel, I want you to understand my side of the story. I was in a difficult situation, and that's why I sinned. Now, in my law office, I hear that all the time. And from a legal perspective, I understand it. And in Maryland circuit courts, I'm going to try to explain it and soften it. But I'm going to say this respectfully. When we sin, there is no because. There is no good reason why not. Here's David when he sinned with Beersheba. Did he say to God, I'm really sorry, but let me try to explain? 
See, she was bathing on the rooftop, and she shouldn't have been there, and I was minding my own business, and I saw it. It just sort of went from there. I know it was wrong, but can't you understand? No. David says, against you, and you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. John writes in his first letter, my little children, these things I write to you that you don't sin, that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, he has an, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. John writes to us not to sin. He gives us no excuses. And if we do sin, when we do sin, then we have Jesus to present our case to God as our advocate. So what do you think Jesus says when he advocates for us? Do you think he sounds like me in the circuit court saying, Father, please, forgive, please excuse Mr. Christian or please excuse Ms. Christian because, see, he was really in a difficult position. It wasn't really his fault. Is that even what you want Christ to say on your behalf? Or does he present his own righteousness, which is around you as a garment? Personally, I have made it a rule not to tell God or not to tell others why I sinned and ask to be excused. I tell the Lord that I have sinned and ask to be forgiven. That's a big difference. There's a big difference between being excused and being forgiven. Now in chapter 15, there is a very curious thing. It is very important to understand, and it is very dangerous. Saul delivered the message of the Lord to Samuel delivers the message of the Lord to Saul that God has rejected him from being king over Israel. He says so repeatedly, and then he says that God's not going to change his mind. But verse 11 says that Samuel grieved all night before that day. And afterwards, he still mourned for Saul. It seemed like he couldn't get over it. You know, we love the flesh. We do. If it was up to us, God's purposes would be accomplished through the flesh, through our own strength, through our own righteousness, or at least to have some part in it. Samuel was a great and godly man. He knows that God has rejected Saul. He was the one who said it, but still, he mourns for Saul. He wants Saul to, exceed, to succeed. He wants Saul to get another chance. He knows Saul can do better. It is very hard to give up on the flesh, to put aside pride and self-seeking. This is from Genesis chapter 17. I know that this is a lot of text up there. Genesis chapter 17 is a chapter of immense importance. It is one of the essentials, both doctrinally and historically. Genesis 17 is the start of the nation of Israel. That is the start of the nation of Israel, where God changes Abram's name to Abraham and gives him the covenant of circumcision. Abraham's 99 years old. The time has come for the long-promised long promised purpose of God to be fulfilled, and God lays it out for him in panoramic vision, a covenant between you and me and your descendants after you and their generations for an everlasting covenant. And notice what Abraham says. And Abraham said to the Lord, Oh, that Ishmael might live before you. Abraham hears the promises of God, and they're great, and they're wonderful, and they're eternal. And he says, can we do it through Ishmael? Lord, I know what you've said about Ishmael, but isn't there some way Ishmael can fit into this plan of yours? And what does God say in response? No, not maybe, not we'll see, no. The Lord God, God said, no, your wife, no, Sarah, your wife shall bear you a son. You shall call his name Isaac. I will establish my covenant with him, with the second, for an everlasting covenant and his descendants after him. God's promises do not come part through the flesh and part through the spirit. They're not part through Christ and part through the Adam in us. They're not most of the old, new and part of the old. God tells Abraham that Ishmael will not be in there with Isaac, not at all, not a little bit. What does God say to Samuel? Does God say, okay, we'll give Saul another chance? No. 
God says to Samuel, how long are you going to mourn for Saul? How long is this going to go on? I sometimes wonder whether he says that to me. How long is this going to go on, Tom? I have rejected Saul. Get up. Fill your horn with oil. Anoint a new king. I've put away the first to establish the second. And you need to catch up with that idea. When Paul wrote to the Romans, he expressed this in the strongest possible terms. He said that our old man is crucified with Christ, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin. The old man is not reformed. He is not rehabilitated. He is not forgiven. He is not given another chance. He is judged and condemned and cast out and rejected and put away. Choose whatever phrase you want. Most people, I will even say many Christians, most people live trying to do what God never did. They try to reform the flesh. We heard about that at the Lord's Supper this morning. And all such efforts to please God in our flesh end in frustration. Because that which is born of the flesh is flesh and always will be until you stop what doesn't work. And turn your life to the second, the spiritual, the new man who is made in the image of Christ. My brothers and my sisters and my friends, let me ask you, what is religion? What is religion in all of its forms, in all of its manifestations? What is religion? I submit to you that religion is essentially our effort to make the flesh acceptable to God. It is our effort to talk God into accepting the flesh. Or maybe to talk us into the idea that he will. For, uh, for some, religion is about sincerity and good works. God has to accept sincerity. He has to accept good works because he's just and he's not going to discriminate anybody. He's not going to be restrictive in his thinking. And anybody who's sincere and does good works will be okay. That's the flesh talking. And by the way, that's where Cain goes to church. Cain really connects with that kind of talk. For some, religion is like is beating down the flesh. If you can beat it down enough, and you can make it contrite enough, and you can make it sorry enough, and if you can make it feel guilty enough, then maybe God will take pity on it. But that's just like Reuben, tearing his clothes, crying out when he saw what happened to Joseph, tearing his clothes. He really didn't want it to happen. For some, religion is a raw, raw good time. You get, go to Sunday to get pumped up, to get in touch with the inner you. To realize that God made you to be a winner. That God wants you to be rich. There's power in every one of us and that your miracle is on the way. Look around. You'll see Esau sitting in the pew. See, you can teach the flesh to be religious. You can teach the flesh to do ceremony. You can teach the flesh to recite rules. You can make the flesh feel guilty about itself. Saul could do ceremony. He put a lot of value in ceremony. The whole excuse for saving the sheep and oxen was for ceremonial offerings. Saul could recite rules. I have performed the commandment of the Lord, he says. Ah, yeah, I know they should have been utterly destroyed, he says. Saul could feel guilty. I have sinned. I have transgressed. But God's not interested in religion. God is not impressed with religion. To obey is better than sacrifice, says Samuel. To heed better than the fat of rams. People think that the ceremony and the rules and the guilt are what God is interested in. Well, all the time, God, what God wants to give you is not ceremony, rules, and guilt, but a new life. Not a reformed life, but a new life. One free of ceremony, free of rules, and 100% free of guilt. A life lived in the Spirit. A life lived in Jesus Christ, and there is nothing better in the world. Instead of living in the flesh... Like Cain and Ishmael and Esau and Reuben and Saul. To live in the spirit. Being saved by faith like Abel. Living in hope and promise like Isaac. 
leaning on Christ like Jacob leaned on his staff, freed from prison and raised up like Joseph, waiting for the kingdom of God like David. A new life with the old put away. It is something of a catchphrase for Christians to ask, what's your life verse? Have you ever heard that? What's your life verse? And people mean by that, what's the verse that sort of grabs you and really helps you on your way forward? For me, Romans 6.13 is the best verse I know for living in righteousness if to, if to any extent I do. Present yourself to God as being alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. I remember when, and I remember where I was when this verse really grabbed me by the shirt and yanked my head down and made me pay attention. I'm alive from the dead. I'm raised with Jesus Christ, made into his image to walk in newness of life. And here I am, presenting myself before God, answering roll call. Present yourself to God as alive from the dead. And however sin manifests in itself in me, or whatever there is of King Saul in you, whether it's anger or jealousy or malice, whether it's materialistic Esau or party animal Ishmael or weak immoral Reuben or angry Cain, that is dead. It's dead. And it has no power over me except what I choose to give it. I am before God, alive from the dead, alive in the spirit, alive in Jesus Christ and remade into his image. And I yield this body, these members, these hands which can do things, these feet which can go places, and even this mouth which has made a thousand mistakes. I yield them as my sacrifice to God to become instruments of righteousness. He's put away the first. He's established the second. So that we, you and me, can live in newness of life. One more thought. And then we're done for this morning to put a coda on this message. And it comes from 1 Samuel chapter 14. If you are a young person of any age, and by that I mean if you still look at your Christian life as an adventure and are anxious to see what's next. If you're a young person of any age, uh, then I want to talk for a moment to you. 1 Samuel 14 is another chapter about King Saul and his battle with the Philistines. We could spend a full time on this chapter. We're going to spend about 150 seconds. The armies of each nation uh, had been drawn up. King Saul, he's the orange line. He's camped at Gibeah. The Philistines are the green line. The key to their position was at Michmash. Who names their city Michmash? I mean, you know. <laughs> Don't want to quarrel, quarrel with the scriptures, but they were at Michmash. The two armies were staring at each other, but nothing much was happening. King Saul was sitting down in the shade, as the scripture says specifically. His son Jonathan decided that he was not just going to sit around and wait for people who ranked him to decide when to start the battle. In verse 6, Jonathan decides to go up against the Philistine garrison, and he says to his armor bearer, Come, let us go over to the garrison of these uncircumcised. It may be that the Lord will work for us, for nothing restrains the Lord from saving by many or by few. And his armor bearer answered, Go then, here I am with you. Many of you will remember a man named Tom Major, uh, a man with a, an evangelist's heart, and he's now with the Lord. Uh, Tom and I were very different in many ways, and we had what I will describe as honest conversations with each other on a few occasions. 
but we did a lot of stuff together in the gospel. Tom loved this verse, and he taught me to love this verse too. You know, sometimes the church, you know, the great big formal thing, doesn't seem to be doing a lot. The enemy is encamped and garrisoned in strength. The enemy is not hard to find. Jonathan had a very simple plan. Let's go up against the garrison of the uncircumcised. There's only one way we're ever going to win the battle, and that's if the Lord works for us. And there's only one way we're ever going to find out if the Lord is going to work for us, and that is if we go. We're never going to find out if the, what God is going to do if we just sit here in our own camp. And it doesn't take the whole army. God doesn't need the whole army. It doesn't matter to the Lord if there are many, if there are few. Jonathan said, you and me, together, that's all it takes. Let's go. Tom Major taught me to love this verse. And so now I commend it to you. Don't ever ever be afraid to try something in the Lord. Don't ever be afraid to step out of line. Don't ever think you have to wait your turn. And don't be afraid to fail. It's okay to try and fail. Jonathan's not afraid to fail. Jonathan says maybe, maybe the Lord will work for us. He's not requiring the Lord to work for us. There are a lot of things that I've tried in my life and someone could look at this or that and say that it failed and okay, maybe so. But if I'm going to fail, I'm going to fail moving forward. The enemy in Baltimore is garrisoned in strength. They are not hard to find. So let's go, you and me. Find somebody to go with you. And if you can't, I'll go with you. Let's find out what the Lord will do, sometimes with, a, with many, sometimes with just a few. I said at the outset that there are two great ways to study the life of Samuel, and we're doing both of them in our series. One of them is its character studies and the spiritual principles that they embody. Next week, our brother, Sean Williams, will be here. He'll have chapter 16 in the anointing of David, and then we have a chance to be together again after that. And we'll consider the second big theme in this series that Jeff Walgamoth laid the foundation for in his message, that Israel was a nation in transition and a nation at the crossroads. I hope you can join us both next week and in two weeks I commend to you the Christian Missions in Many Lands conference, which will be a virtual conference. The lineup is very good. And you can log on, and it is, it is free to attend. I encourage that. And all the various works of the chapel, for every one of you, for every one of you, you're going up against the garrison of the uncircumcised. I can hardly wait to see what the Lord is going to do. In for you. Let's pray, and then we'll be finished. Our Father, we thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ and the grace that he has given us. We thank you, our Father, that you have given us this great salvation. Lord, we pray that we would reach out and get it, that we would live in that which is new and put away the things that are old. Our Father, every one of us, every one of us knows that in our flesh there dwells no good thing. Every one of us can see those things that you have, that, 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 that are displeasing to you in our flesh. and They manifest themselves in our life, and for that, Lord, we are sorry. Our Father, we pray that we would be renewed every day, every day, to stand before you as one who is alive from the dead, yielding our members as instruments unto righteousness. 
We pray, Father, for ministries, so many, and the ministries here, and the Christians here, as we go up against the garrison of the uncircumcised. And Lord, we pray that you will work for us. And we acknowledge that there's nothing we can do unless you work for us. And so, Father, we pray for that. We pray for unity as a people, that we would rejoice and encourage and cheer one another on in this pilgrimage. And Father, this week we pray for our nation. We pray that uh, with a new government elected for both the, the presidency and the Congress, that there would be a healing in our nation, but Lord, we pray for a revival in our nation. We pray for a, an outpouring of your spirit. We pray, Father, that, that this, this difficulty of this pestilence may be removed from us shortly. And we look forward in all things to the service of your Son and to his coming. And Lord, we pray now for our time together in fellowship, thanking you for those who have worked hard that it would be a wonderful time together. And we give thanks in Christ's name. Amen. Thank you for listening to me today. Our meeting is dismissed.